Good afternoon. For the last bit of our program today, we're going to have a few different talks and then uh, some closing remarks from Betty Burke, from, who's you know, Nanog Executive Director. So I'd like to invite up uh, Ross Buntrock, who was scheduled to speak on Monday morning, but we had to reschedule his uh, talk because he had a uh, flight delay. So uh, he's in here now. And the talking talking on uh, cybersecurity regulation. regulation. Is this the, uh, yeah. Everybody, thanks so much. Uh, I want to thank the organizers of the conference for uh, accommodating my schedule delays. Uh, it's 4:30 on the last day of the conference, so may not be the best time to be talking about cybersecurity regulation, but I will try to make it as interesting and engaging as possible, uh, understanding that this isn't typically the type of fair that is presented at these conferences. Um, this is my first NANOC conference, and, and I am really have been enjoying meeting engineers and other smart people who are willing to uh, bring their, their level of discourse down to the level that an attorney can understand. So uh, I'm with the uh, firm of Arnell Golden Gregory in Washington, D.C. I've uh, been in the uh, industry for about 20 years uh, in various aspects and dealing with regulated technology, representing network operators and almost everybody else within, within the ecosystem of the communications industry. So dealing with the FCC, the FTC, uh, the Justice Department, and any other uh, government agency that you may or not want to deal with in Washington. Um, there's been a lot going on with uh, the cybersecurity initiatives uh, in D.C. This, in the past couple of years, um, in the past, and especially this year. Uh, the Obama administration has been very active in pushing their agenda since they came to office in 2009, and the rate at which they have been engaging uh, in calendar year 2015 has been pretty spectacular. Uh, so we're going to really go through and spend most of the time talking through uh, what the administration's been working on, uh, what Congress is addressing right now, and then some of the more recent updates, in fact, updates that just happened yesterday with the uh, passage of the USA Freedom Act and, and other legislation that's pending, and then I'm going to leave uh, plenty of time for questions. So the agenda I want to talk about is really about, you know, the, talking about quantifying the rise in data breaches, which is really driving the administration's cybersecurity agenda. Uh, the framework that the administration has proposed, uh, other efforts that they have proposed in addition to their cybersecurity framework, uh, congressional responses, uh, some other miscellaneous topics, and try to, at the end, really um, help you understand why you should care about this if you don't, um, because many of the people in this room are going to be the folks that, once rules and regulations are ultimately in place, are going to be required to design network architectures and make sure that your networks are compliant with whatever regulatory regime gets adopted. So uh, with that, let's jump right in. Um, anybody who's paying any kind of attention to the news knows that the number of data breaches and cyber attacks is rapidly increasing. Uh, there's a record high of, in 2014 of 783 incidents. So far this year alone, as of April 21st, there have been 256 breaches. Uh, hundreds of millions of records exposed. Uh, the IRS is the most recent, probably biggest, uh, infam most infamous recent uh, breach that has come to light. And I'm sure we're going to hear about many more, unfortunately, as, as uh, the year drags on. Um, again, just kind of showing, <laughs> quantifying uh, what, what, how these things have increased from, 20, from 2010 uh, when we had 662 breaches to the 783 major breaches that the Identity Theft Resource Center noted in, in 2014. So those breaches, along with uh, congressional efforts, are really what's driving the administration's regulatory agenda. And the president, especially in January and February, was out there at every possible turn uh, talking about his cybersecurity and data security agenda and trying to work with Congress. I mean, this is one of the few things in Washington that there can, there's some, some notion of agreement on. Uh, the details certainly get contentious, but 
everyone agrees that it's a problem that is extremely critical. And if you're talking to people candidly, uh, especially people in Homeland Security, uh, other executive agencies, you know, the biggest fear people have is the day when the electrical grid gets taken down or the financial uh, transaction system gets affected in some meaningful way. And so all, all these efforts are aimed at heading off any kind of major attack like that that could really bring uh, the economy to, to its knees. Um, and then there, there's also kind of the consumer facing uh, privacy and, and data security proposals that are out there that are really probably less relevant to, to the people in this room. But to the extent that there are kind of consumer facing breaches that, uh, that operators uh, face, there certainly uh, is an angle, and I'll talk a little bit about the, about the uh, Telstra breach that uh, just was uh, came to light in, at the end of last month. So the the first time the president talked about his cybersecurity framework was in 2013 in the State of the Union address. He released that framework in February and really was urging companies to adopt best practices. Uh, including addressing all of their digital infrastructure and assets, uh, including undersea cables, including all of the access lines that people and operators in this room uh, are responsible for maintaining and, and protecting. Um, you know, it, it's arguably not gone very far and in, in many ways, including going far enough in terms of what it addresses. It's entirely voluntary. Uh, it lacks some of the incentives that, that industry uh, has sought. And there's been a particularly uh, active group of folks that, uh, through the U.S. Chamber that are, have been talking with the administration about changes that they wanted to see uh, in the framework. But I think, uh, you know, my, my final conclusion is that it's too, too soon to say that this thing was a failure or uh, a success. Um, it really is has been guiding for the last couple of years the administration's um, follow-on efforts. And so, uh, again, in this year, uh, the president talked a lot about cybersecurity at, at DHS, and they put out some, some cybersecurity legislation, and one piece of, of legislation that contains a, a number of the initiatives that the administration uh, was, was focused on is actually probably going to be coming up for a vote uh, in the Senate at the end of this month, uh, if you believe uh, what you hear on Capitol Hill. But there's a number of incentives that they propose to get people to share this information. That's really been the biggest focus of, of all of these proposed pieces of legislation, as well as the framework. And the problem, I mean, the reason people don't want to share information, obviously nobody wants to get a black eye in the public. Uh, no one wants to be facing potential liability from class actions, from shareholders. Uh, there's a number of reasons why people don't want breaches to come to light, but there's a lot of reasons why it's important that, that sharing of this type of information takes place. And so that's why the liability protections are, are certainly a key piece of the puzzle. There's also been a focus on the ability of law enforcement to utilize uh, you know, whatever a DHS has at its disposal, including share of information to address cybercrime. And again, this is going to be a major item as things like the IRS attack and, and other uh, industrial attacks uh, come to light. Uh, moving on, again, kind of out of the cyber realm into the privacy and data security efforts, um, there's been a lot of focus on, on that legislation, on the big data report, on the executive order that the president signed addressing cyber threat information sharing and then a Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. Uh, Congress has also gotten involved in the picture. There have been a number of hearings. Uh, the Senate Commerce Committee uh, had a hearing in January. Uh, House Commerce got involved also. Uh, more recently, uh, the House Energy uh, and Co uh, Commerce Subcommittee had a hearing on, on their legislation. And so these are kind of the key provisions here. Uh, H.R. 1560, uh, protecting cyber networks. That bill passed uh, the House in uh, April. It's been uh, sent over to the Senate, and it's reasonably likely, again, that this is probably going to get passed sometime soon. Uh, the, the Cybersecurity Protection Advancement Act of 2015 is, is kind of on hold, but um, some, some common themes among, among these pieces of legislation, again, mostly relating to uh, sharing of information, of threat information, and liability protection. 
Uh, the big data report, I'm sure people in this room probably heard this, heard about this if they haven't read it. Um, this is probably, again, less relevant to, to carriers and network operators, but it does address uh, some of the ways that companies in this room might be utilizing big data, and it really just kind of outlines what's important to the administration in terms of the initiatives that they'd like to see industry uh, adopt, and this is really more of a, this is more of a consumer-facing report uh, calling on basically the utilization of big data for law enforcement, but also asking industry to kind of um, curtail some of the ways that, that big data is being used. So it makes a few recommendations. Again, they're, they're pushing their Privacy Bill of Rights. Um, they're urging the, the passage of national data breach legislation. This has been a, a big initiative that a lot of companies care deeply about because right now we're dealing with a, a basically a 49-state patchwork quilt of data breach obligations. And so when a breach happens, you're forced to conduct different sets of breach notification activities depending on which state, uh, where, where the consumers reside. And so that's a real pain and something that industry is really hoping will be addressed sometime soon. There's also been a push to amend the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Um, this is an act that dates back to the 80s that uh, is, in, is in dire need of being updated. Uh, the most most of the Republicans in Congress actually have, have different ideas about what's the appropriate way to update this act, and most involve again curtailing ways in which the government can obtain and, and utilize information, and put put really kind of higher walls around the way that that uh, corporations and industry can share information with the government, including requiring usage of of, uh, of warrants. Uh, again, another focus on law enforcement and the way that laws, ways that law enforcement can utilize big data to, to do their jobs better. The other thing that the administration has done is created the, the CTIC. Uh, the CTIC is basically the cyber version of the National Terror uh, Coalition, the National Terror Coordination Response, which was formed after 9 11. This is basically the cyber version of, of that initiative that, again, allows the government to coordinate among agencies uh, information about cyber threats that are either, you know, very, uh, very much, you know, on, on the horizon or, or some other information that is not as specific. Um, but it's going to be operated, it is operating under the Director of National Intelligence, uh, again, analyzing the threat information, allowing agencies, you'd be amazed how, how little information sometimes gets passed among agencies in Washington. And so this is to enable government agencies to really talk to each other and have a single point of contact within the relevant agencies to make sure that the right people in the right agencies know exactly what's going on at any given time. And then uh, on February 12th, the, the president signed an executive order um, basically, again, aimed at this goal of promoting private sector security information sharing. And uh, you're probably going to get tired of hearing this, but that, that, that really has been the, the major focus of, of the administration's efforts and of, of legislation that's pending in Congress, is allowing companies to share information both with each other as well as with the government, and also allowing for the government to share information with industry, because right now there's a lot of barriers to that kind of information sharing happening in, in any kind of seamless or coordinated way. Uh, and this is just a, a quote from, from the order itself. Uh, the other thing that, that the uh, executive order does is establish a framework. So again, these are voluntary standards for information sharing. Uh, it clarifies DHS's authority to enter into agreements with information sharing organizations, and it streamlines the ability of companies to, to access classified information. And so basically it's going to set up a framework kind of on an industry by industry basis and then establish uh, basically, again, the single point of contact and hopefully streamline and, and remove some of the barriers from information sharing that exist today. And then the, the president also talked about the, the four principles that really should be guiding um, private industry as, as well as the government when they're talking about sharing uh, information. And again, share, share, share. Um, recognize when government might be able to help. Basically, look at your, at your own uh, company's best practices, and, and governments should be looking, the agencies need to look at their best practices. 
and then you know focus on what has really become a very hot issue again with the discussion around the uh, USA Freedom Act, which addresses the NSA bulk collection program. So there's really been kind of a, a different mindset, and really it's been driven by a, a new generation of Republicans in Congress that have a different mindset about what's the appropriate level of data collection. A lot of Democrats are on the same side, but. Uh, it really has been folks like Rand Paul who really face off with, uh, with Mitch McConnell over this issue and is what led to, to the, the passage of, of the USA Freedom Act and, and its signing by the president yesterday. Uh, again, this, uh, the, the, the administration has been urging for a long time uh, passage of a Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights and they put out a framework. Largely, this was driven by concerns, uh, not, well, plenty of concerns domestically, but there's also been some, some international concerns, particularly with our friends uh, in Europe over uh, the way that our privacy uh, legislation uh, exists or doesn't exist. We're, we're really the only country that doesn't have an omnibus privacy statute that addresses privacy. Our privacy statutes are really kind of on an industry by industry basis, and so you've got privacy laws that pertain to the financial services industry, to healthcare through HIPAA, uh, and then you've got kind of what the FTC does. But um, this is really looking to kind of codify under one umbrella uh, the rules of the road for, for privacy and for data security. And so the, the, the provisions of the bill that the president has proposed. Uh, really address what the FTC is telling people to do, and that's provide conspicuous notice about how you're going to use customer data, make sure that that data is used for the, for the purpose that it's intended, uh, and make sure that customers have a way to have their, their data deleted uh, in, in largely the same way that uh, consumers in Europe have you know, a right to be forgotten and a right to correct information in, in a more uh, streamlined way than, than anything that we have here. Uh, it would permit industries to develop codes of conduct that would be approved by the FTC, and then it would empower the FTC and the state AGs to enforce those those privacy policies. And that's really, I mean, quite frankly, not different, much different than the way it works now. Uh, Nobody is required to have a, a privacy policy in place, believe it or not, but everyone does, and so the watchword for 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 that kind of compliance is you have to basically do what you say you're going to do, otherwise the FTC might come after you. And so when it's something really egregious, uh, you know, the FTC looks for the right cases to, to, to make public and to really try to make an example of. And those are really, really ugly things to get involved with. Um, it's hugely expensive to go through an investigation by the FTC to negotiate a consent decree and then to comply with that consent decree. Most of the settlements that the FTC reaches are 20-year agreements that require, in many cases, annual audits. And so think about the, 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 the compliance costs of once you're kind of in that territory and it would you know, make you, uh, keep you up at night. Um, again, this is just kind of what, what, what the protections are that the, that the administration is advocating in their Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. Um, individual control over what data is collected. Uh, right now, a lot of companies, and particularly apps, collect as much data as they can, whether they have any reason to or not for what they're doing. Um, and so this is intended to address that concern. Uh, transparency in terms of understanding what, the, what exactly what the companies that are collecting the data are doing with it, how they're using it. Uh, a respect for context, and again, this goes to kind of the overreach that's happening in many cases where companies are collecting way more data than they need because they can and because that data can be extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, security, again, we need standards, common standards, industry standards as to how to handle certain uh, personal data. And then the ability to, uh, to address mistakes, which are inevitably uh, going to be made when uh, personal data in huge volumes is being collected. Focus collection, again, is, is, a, is kind of the overreach uh, concern. And the ability to, to basically have, have a, a right to make sure that measures are in place and that they're being adhered to. Um, this is what I'm talking about a little bit now what's been happening recently. Uh, this was a story that came out at the end of May. 
and I thought was directly pertinent to, to folks in this room, and I know folks in Telstra here, um, but when after, shortly after the uh, closing of the acquisition of PacNet, uh, it was revealed that their uh, corporate network had been hacked, and they still don't know to this day uh, who was responsible for that or who uh, was, was behind it. Um, kind of pointing out the fact that you know this, the, these kinds of hacks can happen not only to, to the IRS but uh, to very sophisticated network operators. And you've got a lot of people, a, a lot of bad actors uh, that are very focused on uh, accessing this, <laughs> this data uh, for, for a variety of reasons. But um, it's, it, it's, it's a big problem and it's only going to get worse, uh, I suspect. Um, I mentioned the fact that, that the USA uh, Freedom Act was signed uh, by the president yesterday. Again, that really just goes to uh, a, a major revision of the way that Section 702 of the FISA Act uh, is, is addressed. Uh, it addresses the bulk collection of phone records and basically allows the NSA to hold those records for six months and then turn them back over to the phone companies. Um, yeah, I guess you know, the, the, there's perhaps more public trust in, in the phone companies than, than the NSA these days, and I think that was largely what was driving uh, those changes that were made uh, by, the, by the folks who were in long negotiations with uh, Senator McConnell. Uh, I also mentioned already that the, the cyber security information sharing bill is probably going to get passed um, by the end of the month, most likely. Um, the other thing that I think is really worth touching on, and I don't have a slide on it, unfortunately, but um, this is going to, to bear, and this is a real thing that's happening, uh, with regard to the open internet order, I know that the, a presentation was made on Monday about kind of the, the, the real nitty gritty of what's, what's in that order. Um, but on May 15th, uh, Chairman Wheeler, Chairman of the FCC, issued some guidance about how companies who provide broadband internet access service should be complying with Section 222 of the Communications Act. And not to get too far into the weeds on this, but basically now that, uh, that broadband internet access is being regulated as a telecommunication service, Section 222 now applies to the provision of, of internet access. And so there's a number of, of obligations that are going to be uh, imposed on, on carriers who are providing information, who are providing internet access that up till this point in time had, had never been subject to these kinds of, of rules. And so it's basically a code of conduct and those rules, the specific rules around uh, Section 222's application to internet services isn't clear because again, it, the, the, the law isn't in effect yet. There's also a number of legal challenges to the order, although I think personally that those challenges are not going to be successful. Um, when, when the FCC adopted the open, in, open internet order, they really were following the roadmap that the DC circuit gave to them when they rejected the prior set of, of open internet principles. And so I, I think it's very unlikely that the open, in, open internet order that the FCC has adopted is gonna be overturned on appeal, although there's a lot of people that would really love to see that happen, uh, including some of my clients. Um, but that, that's, that's something that I think a lot of folks in this room are going to have to be concerned about once uh, all the provisions of the FCC's open internet order ultimately go into effect. Uh, so with that, I'm going to skip through the, the nuts and bolts of the Tulsa breach and uh, open the floor up for any questions on the materials I've covered or any other uh, items of interest pertaining to cybersecurity legislation or uh, compliance. Well, I either did a really good job or uh, it's, it's time for cocktail hour. It, it, it shortly be time for drinks. My <laughs> name is uh, Tim Denton. Uh, I'm a former regulator of the CRTC in Canada. We put in net neutrality traffic measures in 2009, and the sky didn't fall. Um, in your opinion, um, what are the principal reasons why you believe, on reasonable grounds we hope, uh, that the FCC's open access order will be maintained by the courts? Well, really because uh, uh, the, the, the decision that the DC Circuit issued striking down the last set of rules kind of spelled out exactly what they did wrong. At, at great length. When they did that, yeah. It was a pretty lengthy order. 
And they really said that what the FCC didn't do the first time was, so you have to go back to really, you know, Computer 2 and the 80s and the distinction between information. I remember them well. <laughs> I do too, but I, luckily for better or worse, I wasn't involved with any FCC rulemakings at that time. Um, but you know, the, the FCC created a distinction between telecommunication services and information services in, in the Computer 2 rulemaking. And that distinction was maintained in the 1996 Telecommunications Act. And so you had this, this distinction that said, you know, one is an information service, one's a telecommunication service. A telecommunication service is a common carrier and is regulated under the rules of common carriage and has a bunch of different rules and regulations that shouldn't be applied to information services. And don't force me to, to come up with the exact definition of information services, but in order to promote internet adoption and, and usage, there was a, a lot of people in Congress and at the FCC who said, look, we need to take a hands-off approach no, to, I, to the internet. I understand, I understand all that you're saying that, uh, perfectly true, but um, the reclassification of all this back into carriage and therefore the common carriage rules, right, may right. strike us as sensible on policy grounds, but... Um, Procedurally, well, they didn't do the right, th they didn't go through the right steps to do that. They basically, they, they kind of just turned on a dime uh, and, and said, you know what, we're changing our mind about the way that we're, we're going to ultimately reclassify without saying that we're, re we're reclassifying. And so they applied a number of obligations that apply to common carriage in, in the first open internet rules. So you believe they've just done it properly now, that the way they've done it properly has been already, they've given the menu f for doing this by the court already, and that it therefore will withstand the sharp-eyed lawyers of the opposition. Well, it's, it's, it's the DC Circuit is, is the panel, it's basically one, the, it's the appellate court that typically appeals, uh, that typically addresses most agency appeals. And the next step above them is the Supreme Court. So yes, they, they basically said, look, FCC, when you did this the first time, you didn't go through all these steps that you should have done in order to reclassify uh, broadband internet access service as a common carriage service that's regulated under Title II. So in order to do that, here's what you should have done, and that's what the FCC did. I mean, to, to, be, to put so, it in its So having terms. obeyed the court, having obeyed the court, they're in good standing with that court. That's my opinion. I, I, you know, there's lots of people that think that there's lots of holes in the way in the order, and that, that they have a good chance. I, I personally don't believe that. I, I, I think that even though I may, may not agree with with the way that the order was written and, and certain of the, of the way that the, the FCC has, has come to its conclusions, I think that they have compiled an order that I think is going to withstand uh, appeal, appeal. Thank you. That's a perfectly reasonable answer. Thank you. Mike Joseph, Google. Um, on the topic of uh, information sharing and cybersecurity obligations, during the course of your talk, you both highlighted the efforts from the administration and Congress to enable protections and, and methods by which you can encourage information sharing, largely voluntary, um, by corporations with government agencies. But then simultaneously, you point out that, uh, particularly in light of the NSA activities, but, but also more generally, there's been an effort to increase uh, privacy controls, um, both within the private sector and in government. Um, and in fact, at one bullet point, you highlight that there's pending legislation to uh, create more barriers for information sharing in certain cases. So which direction do you see the wind blowing predominantly uh, right now in DC? I, I think that the, the legislation I was mentioning that, it, that I think is likely to pass is going to promote kind of higher level information sharing that doesn't pertain to specific consumer identifying information. And so I think, I, I, think, I think that the wind is blowing, to answer your question in its most simple terms, is going to blow in the direction of making sharing easier and without potential liability. And I think the other, the other focus on sharing that, that I think is, that a lot of people are focused on is the sharing of government information with industry. I think that's really uh, the focus of a lot of, of people and that's, I mean, of course the government 
has a lot of information about certain attacks that they may not want to. There's a lot of reluctance, I think, by agencies to, to make this public and to share with industry because, you know, there's not only there's not only uh, legal reasons why they can't do it now, but there's also kind of policy reasons why they aren't are necessarily excited about doing so. But I do think that people are really, especially in capital, are beginning to understand the gravity of these threats and understanding that we are woefully unprepared uh, for, for what might be coming down the pike. I was on a panel in January with a gentleman from Kaspersky, and you know, some of the things he was talking about really were, were, were extremely frightening. And this is a guy who's walking around with you know, an, an, analog, an old flip phone. I mean, he's, uh, I think the people are walking around in the government not really fully appreciating just how serious the threats are. And, and I think that people are finally getting the message, and that's why I think that the momentum is moving in, in the direction of, of more sharing instead of less. There's already today forums, uh, both private forums amongst members of industry, as well as certain government-sponsored, largely FBI-sponsored activities um, for corporations to come together, sometimes in the presence of the government, sometimes not. Um, but do you, do you see a push towards a greater framework wherein the government agencies would serve as a clearinghouse for information sharing between corporations? In other words, where private sector would be sharing information with the government and then the government would redistribute that information back to member entities? That, that's part of what the president really wants to do with the creation of the cyber uh, threat mechanism is to create a, basically a single portal for that kind of sharing to, so that, that information can go in both directions and then, again, to your point, be dispersed among the relevant uh, executive agencies of the government. So yeah, I think that's absolutely the direction that the administration wants to see, th see things move and whether the next administration, whoever that is, will, will maintain that. I, I think it's a pretty common sense policy that has gotten a lot of buy-in now. And so I think that especially, I think there's really nobody that would tell you that they think that the, uh, the terror uh, kind of clearinghouse that was created in 2001 hasn't worked. I mean, uh, you know, there hasn't been you know, a, a major terrorist attack on, on U.S. soil. So I think that there's a lot of buy-in uh, um, on every level, and I think that that's going to be the framework that we're going to see ultimately put in place and, and carried out. Thank you. Uh, Michael Thompson, Argonne National Labs, um, partially in response to the other questions, but um, I just wanted to point out, thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, I think there's a lot of distrust from the private sector about uh, what various things the federal government is doing, and, and I think it's, it's important uh, to point out that there, the federal government is a huge and disorganized entity um, or set of entities. and. Um, there's a lot of the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing, but also I think it's important to point out that there are large portions of the federal government that are legitimately trying to do positive things to protect critical infrastructure. Um, but, but it's very difficult to do that without private sector cooperation. And um, I think it's very understandable and, and commendable that the, the private sector wants to see um, you know, transparency and, and wants to have accountability in any data that they share, but that, that you know, really the private sector in a lot of ways holds sort of the keys to the kingdom as far as the data and without that sort of willingness to share, and I think um, the idea that the other questioner brought up about having these sort of information clearing houses where different private sector entities can come together, um, have sort of a third party to be able to help uh, facilitate that information sharing with PCII protections and other things is is great and there needs to be more of that but sort of uh, raising the level of awareness and bringing out the fact that there are you know various government entities that are trying to do positive things in the best way that they know how and that there's there's not necessarily this you know one entity is trying to like trick the other or whatever, but um, you know, there are positive things happening and, and I think more cooperation is going to make that, bring the transparency level up. No, so. I agree, I agree with you. I mean, there's, everybody who's dealing with this uh, in the relevant uh, federal agencies are, are trying to do the right thing. I don't think anybody is, is, has, has any uh, ill motives. And to your point, the government does recognize that they can't do this alone, that they need, uh, they need the trust and the information from, the pri from private sector to, to flow to them. So, I think, you know, in, in light of what's happened, you know, since the Snowden revelations and, and other issues, there's been a huge campaign to try to repair some of that credibility uh, problem. Um, but I mean, and the other point, I mean, if you read the 9-11 report, you, you do understand how 
horribly disjointed and the fact that there is there was very little ability even if they wanted to for agencies to exchange this information in any kind of an organized way and so that's really what what the administration is focusing on is trying to, to kind of create a framework that is known to everyone that there's public agreement upon and then to allow that information to flow freely jeff houston a Penny. I'm, I'm not a u.s citizen and when you talk about, as you have, personal privacy, what people are you talking about? For example, the European legislation about the right to be forgotten was actually about the right of Europeans to be forgotten by European collected data. When you talk about personal privacy in the US context, and when you say, for example, the uh, White House summit, the focus on protecting the privacy and civil liberty of the American people. Now, Personal data is everywhere, and personal data about all kinds of people is in all kinds of data centers. Is the scope of what you're talking about in the US context referring only to US citizens or all personal data, irrespective of where they might reside, that is inside US jurisdictional areas? Well, that's a debate that's actually playing out very publicly right now with, right. with the Microsoft case and you know, where, where Microsoft is really uh, defending very, very, uh, very vociferously their, their rights to maintain data uh, off of the U.S. soil and, and, and the government saying, look, we don't care where you store this data, we want access to it. So, I mean, I, I think that, yes, the, the administration's efforts are focused on, on American citizens because that's the only jurisdiction that, that that they have, that we have, uh, but yeah, there, there's there, there's certainly a lot of holes, and you know, the, arguably, some people argue that you know it's way too late and way too little at this point in time to kind of put this genie back in the bottle. Um, but yeah, I think I think that people have been extremely chagrined to understand, you know, how how little remains of their personal privacy and. And if you read, I'm reading a book right now, um, David and, uh, Data and Goliath, uh, the China, Bruce Schneider book, um, pretty fascinating read about you know, really how, how little personal privacy uh, we, we probably have left. And at this point in time, it's really more about preventing bad guys from getting access to the troves of data that's already been collected on, on all of us. But do you think 200 different regulatory frameworks will help or hinder? <laughs> I don't know. I guess time will tell. <laughs> well, we're going to find out, are we? We're going to find out. <laughs> Thanks. Find out. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. You've been a great audience, and I'm happy to take questions uh, offline, and, and uh, my email's on my slide, so feel free to reach out to me in any way that, that you would like. But thank you again.